So you've started collecting your data, but really you need to think about writing up your research. Let's look at the different ways we write up and how important it is to start writing up now. So how do you target your study? Give initial thought to where you will publish. Does your target journal often accept case studies or is it a quantitative journal or is it a modeling journal? If so, case studies not for you. Is there in your target publication a number of case studies and one that's similar to what you want to do that you can use as a model? Who's the audience? Because obviously I, I've been speaking extensively about um, journal papers, but actually you might do a, a case study that your target is actually the public or policy makers who have different interests and preferences. So you've got to think of how are we going to do this so it meets different audiences need. If you've written an academic paper, you may consider a public version for non-specialists. What exactly would you put in that to make it more accessible? Can you clearly communicate why the study is representative? Are you going to represent and communicate the information about the phenom phenomenon in a clear and crisp way for an academic journal? Or is it going to be a, a more easily consumed presentation for the public? Arguments made, you, you can do pictures, process charts, graphs. You can support the claims you make with quotes. And these are all ways to make the arguments clearer. But it's all about targeting, targeting your audience correctly and making sure the way you're producing and structuring your work is fit for the, for the right audience. So structure, structure, structure. Most common academic work follows a very linear analytical structure. You outline an issue, you provide literature, method, case study, discussion, conclusions, future work. This approach may include some of the others below, but our approach from academia is normally finding the propositions in literature that frame a research question, and then the method helps you address the research question. You explain the case, you then discuss it in light of the literature, which leads to conclusions and then future work. You might have comparative structures, which involve repeating the case multiple times from different perspectives. So, if you compare alternative descriptions or explanations, perhaps, for example, if you were looking at Brexit, is it good or bad? And is it responsible for the 2023 tomato shortage? You could argue for and against Brexit as an explanation. Those are rival explanations. Chronological structures present the case in linear time. But disproportionate attention is usually given to earlier events and not enough to later ones. To balance that out, often, you know, you might consider writing your case study in reverse. So you start with the more recent things and then write uh, the old ones afterwards. That might help balance the focus. Theory building structures follow the logic of theory or framework in the narrative of the case. I've also written papers like this where I have a theoretical framework and I, I structure the case following that theoretical framework. It's, it's very different from chronological or, or, or simple narrative, but it explains how my case research fits to the, the um, theoretical framework we built. Suspense structures and presents the findings and then explains it. So this suspense idea is this is what we found and then this is how we found it. Uh, unsequenced structures refer to the presentations of findings where the order can be changed and it doesn't really alter the descriptive value. It's when you've almost got a module structure for the case study where you can speak about it in chunks and you can mix them around and it's re relatively unstructured. Start writing now is, is some very good advice. You can start on the literature reviews immediately, right as you go, with fully automated referencing. It's very difficult if you find it a little gem in a paper and you don't write it down in references, it's very difficult to find it again later and it'll haunt you at night. Um, methodology can also be drafted as procedures should be decided on in the protocol and the design. So you can start drafting your methodology and, and also you can pull bits from the literature review because you'll get ideas from, oh, I see this paper's got a case. That's given me more ideas for my method and that can evolve. 
Um, you can draft descriptors of the cases as you proceed. I think that's a very good idea. It engages you more deeply in the cases that you're working on. If you are producing images, graphs, process charts, create them as you go and share them maybe if, if it's appropriate with your research design so people can go, oh yeah, you know, I've missed a bit from mine because I can see that in somebody else's. Any early writing will reveal potential problems with your design protocol, gaps in data or theory that you can address now. If you don't start writing now, you'll only hit problems later on and it'll be much more difficult to go back and resolve. Key question you're going to be faced with is, do you name people, places, organisations, or do you use pseudonyms? So made up names or do you leave it anonymous? Naming locations, organisations is a key ethical decision. It's always nice to see the name of a widely known place or organisation because it helps people identify quickly with the context. But is it really necessary for the learning to use real names? Identification can introduce bias. Naming organisations shouldn't help your contribution to theory. Um, it might help you get published if you write a paper about a very large organisation, but it shouldn't make a difference to theory. Identifying people and organisations may create issues for them in the future. This is your ethical and, to be honest, your moral. It's beyond ethics. I think it's more moral concerns for you. You will need written permission to name people, organisations or places. You'll also need to give people the opportunity to withdraw. Um, you know, look at the Data Protection Act, the General Data Protection Regulation. And um, you can get into a lot of trouble if you start naming people and uh, they have the right to be forgotten. How do you delete that? And the mixtures of named and anonymous may also be problematic, uh, as you've got to be careful not to enable re-identification. So if somebody says, no, I don't want to be named, but you named their organisation and their position, well, it's pretty obvious who they are so they can easily be identified. Actually, any three points of data can often point to an exact individual. Pseudonyms are useful. Um, you know, often I have renamed organisations. Uh, I tend to pick a theme, Greek gods, planets, which is also often Greek gods, obscure places, you know, places with funny names, and I, I name my organisations after that. A friend of mine wrote a book on tax law and um, renamed all the companies after uh, people from Star Wars. So wh whatever floats your boat, but pseudonyms are a useful way of doing it. So be very aware of the UK laws on personal data and as well as the European, but Data Protection Act is concerned with personal data and you know it, it's related to any living individual who can be identified. Personal data has to be about a living person, not records about deceased, although such data could still be protected by confidentiality or other legal rules, so be careful. Under Article 17 of the uh, General Data Protection Regulations, individuals have the right to have personal data erased. It's the right to be forgotten. It only applies to delta data held at the time the request is received and is not absolute and only applies in certain circumstances. Read the exemptions. I mean, I've published quite a lot of papers now with companies named in it. I always get permission up front and it does protect you against this sort of stuff. I tend not to name individuals because I really don't see the point. Your, your paper needs to stand the test of time. You know, I'm in management and who was the manager at a particular position? Unless I'm particularly interested in that individual's um, career, then it's really about, you know, what happened because of power, you know, their position of power as opposed to them as an individual.